Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and I'm joined by John Todd. Again, it's been a little over a year since we talked <laughs> about Claude 9. Um, I dove into a video talking about DNS, and lots of debate happened, and I was wrong about a few things. But uh, John was really kind enough to help explain not just how Quad9 works and how DNS works and how DNS filtering works, but a lot of other things. I'll leave a link to that previous video, but there's been a few things that have changed in the last little over a year since we did the last video. So how you doing, John? All right, great, great. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, that's exciting. So I, a lot of things have changed in the last year, a lot of them about Quad9, but actually I wanna kick this off by talking a little bit about the thing that's sort of on everybody's mind, and I know you've already talked about somewhat, which is, a Facebook outage of earlier this week and on Monday. Oh yeah, because uh, that's still the ripples of that are are washing back and forth across the you know the policy and operational oceans. <laughs> um, yeah. So so we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in that. Um, and I guess I wanted to just kind of talk about what our perspective was on that, um, just because you know I think that every part of the industry, whether you're DNS or whether you're routing or whether you're you know a, a, a authorization, validation, advertisements, everybody saw kind of a, an effect of this and it's been very interesting to watch it. Um, so like everybody, um, we saw Facebook go down here ourselves, but then of course, almost almost exactly coinciding with that, we saw across our network, uh, we've got like 180 plus locations worldwide. We saw a dramatic rise and in increase in query volume. <laughs> um, <laughs> this was from Facebook, both humans, but also from apps doing very rapid requests um, to the Facebook's infrastructure, which wasn't answering. So they asked again, and they asked again, and they asked again. Um, and so uh, we saw in some locations, we saw more than double um, our normal total query volume. That was almost all that that entire volume was, of course, the the request for Facebook. And it was all, we responded back with serve fail because we couldn't talk with the Facebook backend servers because of their BGP issue, they were unavailable. Um, so this was really a fascinating uh, test of some people's infrastructure, uh, ours included. Um, we did see uh, a little bit latency, a uh, higher latency at the higher ends of things where you know the, the slowest possible query structure, the slowest cost possible bands were increased, but we think that that's mostly the Facebook responses failing out. Um, and the serve fails, meaning that we are answering no back to people who are asking. We're actually able to answer that really, really rapidly. Um, and so that was fine. We didn't see an appreciable um, service impact in almost any of our daylight locations, which are the people that were asking the most questions. Um, so that was good. Uh, some other providers, however, um, because of the way they were structured, were handling failures um, in a different way that was more CPU intensive. And so some providers actually saw a significant increase in lag uh, on their responses or actually fell over entirely on the DNS. So this is how you know, one, just one provider in one place caused a cascading failure that has repercussions downstream to other systems. So um, I guess it's more of a proof of how well and tightly, or, or I guess well, not well is the right term, how badly and tightly DNS is integrated with everything. Yeah, I think, the in, in correct me if I'm wrong, I understand this, you get to the technical details, Facebook has a really short TTL under DNS. And, and their short TTL is part of their strategy to constantly right. refresh it so they can redirect you to what they refer to as the most healthiest route. Yep. So as they do healthy routes and keep them on short TTLs, there's a constant query coming. And it's fine if it's answering the same all the time, but then the technical problem becomes the short TTL means, is it there yet? Is it there yet? Yeah, it's correct. And combined with... Um, the other side of the technical aspect of you going and answering a query, but then querying back up to the Facebook servers, asking them, and depending on how it's configured, you know, you have a certain timeout wait. So there's a timeout wait for the unresponsive Facebook servers, which aren't there anymore. And because of their routing issues, causing a slowdown on that side while it's doing the answer side every few minutes based on this really short TTL, like yep. you said, creating a cascading uh, yep. error that brought down more than just Facebook. Well, that's that's a thing that we've seen a trend towards, which is I think I think it's unfortunate, in that people are shortening up their TTLs, especially you know people who think that they have highly changeable results. Um, so, so short TTLs have become kind of a thing, and that kind of works in their disinterest if there's a failure. Um, so a TTL of five tenths, five or ten seconds, or thirty seconds, or even a few minutes, um, it works great for that kind of load balancing, load sharing environment. But it actually works against you if you've got even a transient problem on your back end because um, 
the, the way the graph looks is that the TTL holds an answer in memory for a certain period of time. And uh, so a certain percentage of DNS servers are going to have that in memory for that period of time. And they're going to answer back to their clients with the you know, correct answer until the TTL expires. Now, as soon as the TTL expires, uh, you go and ask the back end. Now, if the back end isn't responsive, it, it times out, and there's a you know depends on how long you want to wait for a timeout. But it's a couple of, you know 15 seconds, in some cases five seconds, for a timeout, and the client then receives a you know serve fail, can't can't talk to the authoritative server. So now the question is, how long does the client remember the serve fail and do they immediately request again to the same recursive resolver or a different recursive resolver in other words how do they handle that most will, re will answer or ask the question of a different recursive resolver um, and then if they get two serve fails or three serve fails or however many serve fails are handed back like, in other words if all of the recursive resolvers say i don't know how long do they keep that um, and when do they ask again and so those kind of like those are interesting questions that that contribute to these kind of failure modes. Like if they if they don't wait at all, if they're like, oh, I got three failures, I'm going to start the cycle again. Well, then, yeah, you're going to get you're going to get a huge influx of new queries, which is I suspect some of the what we saw in this in this Facebook failure uh, on Monday. So um, and then the other question is, how long does the recursive resolver operator, like in our, in our case, how long does Quad Nine? hand back the serve fail result before we try again to communicate with Facebook servers. And that's, that is also something that is potentially and, and is configurable on the recursive resolver stack. So, you know, there are a lot of buzz in the last couple of days is, all right, well, what do, what do we do as recursive operators? Do we change the length of serve fails? Um, that we, like, how long do we retain a serve fail? Do we retain it for longer to reduce the the overload on Facebook or whoever the failed service provider do we do we increase so that we don't ask that of course re increases the interval of failure because if we say all right we're going to remember the serve fail we're going to remember it for three minutes five minutes whatever that time is then even if the service comes back in that window we're not going to ask the authoritative server so there's a trade-off between not flooding the authoritative server and and um, getting the service back and operate operational again so this is re this is renewing some discussions about how that works there's also the concept of what's called serve stale um, which is um, rearing its head again uh, and serve stale means that uh, a recursive resolver will get an answer from an authoritative and keep it in its cache for a ttl and theoretically at the end of the ttl uh, it discards it but actually in practice in mo most practical terms not, it won't ask at the end of the TTL. It will ask slightly in, uh, before the end of the TTL if it's an active name. In other words, if there's a lot of activity on that name, why wait and not have an answer? When you know the TTL is about to expire, you're actually going to go out and ask the authoritative server in advance of the TTL expiring. Anyway, if you don't get an answer, let's say you get a serve fail. Now, a serve fail means that I wasn't able to communicate with the authoritative server. Then maybe if your local policy on the recursive resolver indicates this, you can answer with the last previous good answer you got. And that's called serve stale. And there are some recursive resolvers that support this and some that don't. Um, and uh, this was sort of a, this is a, an ongoing discussion of, all right, well, what does serve stale imply? Because now you're lying, right? You're actually giving an answer back yeah. that, that isn't within the TTL that the authoritative server provided you. But in most cases, the authoritative provider would say, hey, if I'm serve fail, yes, please <laughs> answer answer with the last thing you got from me, because that's better than no answer at all. Um, but now this becomes a subjective question of what domains should be serve staled and what recursive resolvers will implement serve stale? How long will you answer a serve stale for? Um, so it's becoming an interesting policy question that isn't that there are some discussions about standardization, but it's still very much a subjective question. I and it's crazy to me to think that in my, you know, 20 years ago, I was a mail server administrator and these are problems we ran into that were exasperated because everyone cached a lot of things because 20 years ago, internet was a lot slower. So it was frequently cached and not respected uh, to get the DNS failure. So we'd move a mail server for a client. It would take right. a, way longer <laughs> than it should have to try to get yeah. the new records updated. Yeah. They're like, oh, we're just going to hold these for, for 48 hours. <laughs> we're, starting, we're starting to flip that, right? Where DNS operators are dropping their TTLs to the point where it's actually hurting them. Um, we are of the opinion that longer TTLs are better because it, it makes the volume of the queries reduce, et cetera, et cetera. We're also not big believers in using the DNS necessarily to direct 
content, although I, I totally understand why that's the case. Some providers have to do it that way. Um, it, there are better, I believe, <laughs> I'll put that, I'll take that outside of the organization, but I believe there are better ways to direct content that are at a deeper layer inside the web stack so that you can redirect people to the, to the more appropriate destinations without using the DNS because the DNS is not a very good signaling model for figuring out where users are. Um, it might be a better model for indicating what servers are available in general, but it's, I don't think it's a very good indicator for where users are, which is very often the whole reason that the TTLs are lowered and the concept of freshness is an issue because, all right, well, where ge geographically are you um, or politically are you that, uh, that, that directs that DNS query? But that's a, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> It's really interesting, though. One of the side notes that I thought was uh, good in the Facebook write-up is they were slowly turning everything back on. You know, doing a cold start of a data center, not easy, right. um, not always in people's playbook very well, because uh, failover is one thing, but actually this whole restart thing they were doing with new routes is how many megawatts it would take. And kind of like you said, how long do you hold on to a serve <laughs> stale? Because yeah. they're trying to balance how many megawatts uh, can we pressure? Because when the sure. when the things come on, things are going to flood. We have a backlog of connections and updates that are going to want to come in. And will this overload certain areas? And uh, that's just... Well, <laughs> they, they actually did some of that. And I'm not sure if that was intentionally or unintentionally. Um, when we saw Facebook come back, uh, when we saw their DNS servers become reachable again, there were there were some brief moments of connectivity where we saw queries coming back. Um, I was actually watching packet dumps on some of our larger recursive resolver clusters, looking specifically for responses from any of the Facebook uh, authoritatives. And we would see a few come back, and then there'd be two minutes or so of no responses, and then we'd see a few responses come back, and then a couple minutes of no responses, and then it started it started increasing where we'd get valid responses. But then uh, we were also seeing refused, meaning we were sending queries out and they were sending us refused responses in return, which, as I said, might've been intentional. It might've been unintentional um, based on their load. Um, so there, there was some um, natural um, uh, curve there in bringing things back or at least allowing people to even know where Facebook's servers were to connect to them. Hmm. It's it's complicated because uh, we've made things so big. It's almost like it doesn't feel like it should have scaled to this big in some circumstances. <laughs> like it's kind of yeah. a lot to think about. If you were to ask me 20 years ago, we're going to build a system that we have 2 billion users going to log in every day. I'm like, you're going to do what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Huh. So and, and honestly, um, Facebook's namespace is not the largest on the Internet by any stretch. Right. There are much larger namespaces that if they went down uh, and if there was this kind of... Um, pathology of rapid re-requests would be much worse. Um, so yeah, I think that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not okay with this failure happening, but I'm certainly interested in the lessons it's going to teach everybody um, on the authoritative DNS side and also on the recursive side. Like what are we gonna take as lessons on how to make this work better in the future? And um, things like serve stale or increased TTLs or um, uh, extended DNS errors is another one. Actually, that's a new one since, since we've last spoken. Um, that uh, has come out that, that might be able to allow clients to understand a little bit more about why certain failures are happening so that they don't re-request you know, over and over and over and over when there's no information that's going to come back. It's always fascinating to me, you know, set aside the name Facebook or whatever problems they may be experiencing. The technical aspect of it becomes really interesting because you're, we're still talking about building these large scale networks and how do we deal with things at this, you know, this many million requests per second, this many million DNS uh, entries. Yeah. That's always where the technical hack comes out and we go, how do we really solve this problem? Who cares who it's for? Let's how, how do we really dig into it and what policies yep. need to be around is uh, it's, it's just a fascinating idea to me. Well, there's 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 certainly a lot of effort underway to try to make things scale better. Um, I'm also going to say that there are a lot of changes underway in the DNS in particular that will challenge that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, things like encryption, as an example, which is great for privacy, but is not so great for scale, right? Because now you're layering an additional encryption tunnel, essentially, on top of the DNS. So the scaling that is going to be more challenging. Um, and uh, and things like Oblivious Doe, which you may have heard comments about, or uh, which adds like even two more hops into every DNS transaction for those people who implement it. Um, so that's 
that's going to be fascinating to see how the reliability and performance is versus privacy. And so that's these are some of the trade-offs, right? The, the, the trade-offs of scale versus uh, cost versus privacy and and how you balance those. Um, I, I'm 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 really pleased to be sitting at kind of the, the crux of some of those questions with Quad9 because of course we have all of those things. We have the privacy, scalability, and and as a nonprofit, certainly the cost comes into play as well. So um, it's a very interesting place to be right now with the DNS and then with the, the, the downstream scaling things as well of what the DNS serves. So besides Facebook and the new logo that I have behind me, yeah, what are sure. some of the other new things that we can talk about over at Quad9? Sure. Um, well, one of the new things, and that you said the logo behind you, uh, in February of this year, Quad9 actually changed where we are headquartered. We changed our, our foundation status. So we were a 501c3 based in the United States, and that organization still exists, but we have transferred the, the Quad9 Quad is now a Swiss entity based in Zurich. Um, and the reason we did that uh, is really um, to make life more difficult for us, <laughs> and that doesn't sound that doesn't sound reasonable. But as a U.S. entity, there are no laws in the United States that that as a nation govern privacy. Um, so, as a U.S.-based organization, people in Europe and actually the rest of the world would ask us, "Well, what is the? You say you're doing certain things with privacy, but there's no there's, who holds you to those guidelines?" And yeah, our answer was, we, "We don't have any." Yeah, I mean, you're just going to take us at our word because there's nothing really that prevents us from doing whatever we want with your data. You're just going to have to think that we're a nonprofit and you, you, you know, you believe us. So that, that, that doesn't hold, right? That doesn't hold any water over time. Switzerland has one of the strictest data privacy policies in the world. Um, we have to comply with Swiss data protection laws, which are essentially a superset of the GDPR. Um, so, and, and there are laws in fact in Switzerland that make us, liable not simply at civil but also in criminal ways if we if we violate those privacy laws so switzerland really holds quad nine now to a much higher standard of privacy meaning that what we say we do we have to do uh and there are laws that, that regulate that so there's no there's no weasel room around that um additionally switzerland has really good laws as far as um transparency and how information requests would be transmitted to quad nine so there are no secret um, laws in switzerland there's no secret requests um, so if someone asks us for information we're allowed to say that someone asked us for information we, we still have to comply with the laws of switzerland don't get me wrong but there are no there's no uh hidden requests that can be applied to us in switzerland so that's kind of a secondary aspect that's a very far trailing issue because Quad9 doesn't have any data to give, whether we're in the United States or whether we're in Switzerland, we, we don't collect any data, so it's not that big a an issue. But it's really, it's, got, it's telling end users, you can trust us because you don't just simply have to trust who we are, we are held by law. And anybody in the world can actually, not just Swiss and citizens, but anybody in the world can actually uh, can sue us if we violate or if they believe we violate their privacy. So. Um, that's another interesting component of Swiss law. And, and it, go into the website. There's actually a huge, we have a huge session in our privacy policy, which describes all of the findings of law that we did with Switzerland. It was a very long and involved process, um, excruciatingly long with, with legal. Um, but we thought it was worthwhile because we, we are now really the only major DNS provider that can say we're held to a privacy standard by law, not just by our say-so. I think this is interesting because this is a concept that, you know, I didn't know and until I started digging into other cases. You're like, wow, European law works with a few different concepts that just don't apply in U.S. law. And uh, like you said, no secret laws and things like that. It can be it, it's really good from a privacy standpoint. It's kind of it almost seems unusual. And, and, and of course, my European friends think it's unusual. Some of the laws we have around. Things. <laughs> um, so, it, yeah. But that, that's really cool, though, because I think it gives people that extra confidence they're looking for of, you know, everyone waves the flag of we do privacy. We do nothing with your data. And then when something happens, you're like, oh, by the way, we had all your data. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there's and, nothing you can do about it because you, do about it. you can just say, I don't like those people because they lied to me. And that's as far as the, it goes. But actually moving yourself there gives you that, like you said, there's a real, not just civil, but perhaps criminal consequence that can come yeah. with that particular aspect. So I think it's, that's a really interesting move. It's a double-edged sword. And that's the other news I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, so the double-edged sword is that, of course, we are, um, that, that European law does apply to us. And a specific component of European law is the Lungaro Convention which allows uh, European nations, plus a, a couple of others who are not necessarily in the EU, EU like Switzerland, um, to raise civil suits uh, in the courts. 
And there's the other piece of news you'll find on our website. We've actually been, we were presented with a lawsuit in June of this year um, by Sony Entertainment. Um, they, uh, their assertion in German courts is that um, by resolving a certain domain name, <laughs> which happens to be a server, I believe, in the Ukraine, um, by resolving that domain name, we are indirectly uh, abetting um, copyright infringement because that domain name has links which lead to another site that has uh, allegedly has um, downloadable songs that, that were in Sony's huh. uh, portfolio. So um, they asked the German court to uh, apply an injunction on us that prevents us or that, that holds us accountable for resolving those domain names. In other words, they said, you, you must not um, uh, resolve this particular domain. Um, and they then could apply that to us in Switzerland because of this convention. So hmm. that was in June. Um, as soon as we learned about it, as soon as the court presented this to us, we actually did we, and we currently are filtering that single domain name for just German citizens in just Germany um, to prevent them from reaching that site. And we, have, of course, are filing and have filed an objection to the ruling, um, which we are still, and that's still in the court process. Um, so it's, it's a, I'm not going to talk much about the, what we, how we believe that, that we don't, that this doesn't apply to us because we actually, we, we actually published our, again, in, in the spirit of transparency, we, we published both the injunction as well as the entire text of our objection, um, on our website. You can go read that in both English and German. Um, but really I'd, I'd like to kind of talk about what happens if we lose or what happens if we just entirely, if we give up and don't do anything and if the industry gives up and doesn't do anything. Um, the assertion is that that an, a private organization such as Sony would be able to present a private or, or public organization such as uh, a recursive resolution operator like Quad9 with a domain and say, we believe that this site is violating some of our rights. Um, in this case, it happens to be copyright. Um, and you must stop resolving it because you are indirectly abetting that site. Um, we believe that that would be an extraordinarily dangerous precedent, uh, even though this court case might not address the future precedent. It certainly is a, it's a significant portion of what the outcome will be. Yeah. Um, but, you know, having one company or one organization or one individual even be able to assert a, a, and present a, a, what is effectively censorship against another, um, it's not censorship if they believe their rights are being, uh, violated, but still they are, they are effectively stopping access of a remote site, which might not even be within their jurisdiction. We think that's a really dangerous thing. And as us, for us as an organization, as an example, it becomes untenable. We can't field, you know, hundreds or thousands of requests from, from companies or individuals saying we need you to stop resolving these domains, um, without necessarily having any proof of that or without having any due process. Um, so that's a real challenge, not just for us, but we believe that that's also going to fall through to anybody else who does anything involving a domain. So like safe browsing, um, firewall operators, um, anybody who does antivirus work, they could similarly be presented in our belief with a list of domains by rights holders or anyone else to say, you must stop resolving this. And that is where, why we are so concerned about this particular ruling. Um, it's interesting that this ruling occurred you know, within or, or this this process started within about a month or so of us appearing in Switzerland, and it's interesting that we are, as a nonprofit, the one who seems to be singled out um, of all the possible organizations doing DNS recursive resolution in Europe. Um, they picked one in a different country who happens to be a nonprofit. Um, so anyway, it's a it's a fascinating case. What we're hoping for, and we have received, and this is actually this is actually makes me feel really good about, again, working with Quad9, is that we received a huge influx of individual um, sponsorships, like, you know, small people contributing five, 10, $20 or 20 euros or 20 francs to Quad9 uh, in the hopes that that can work in, in our favor in the lawsuit. And we're really appreciative of all our, our individual sponsors. But what we're really looking for more is also industry support. Um, if any of you watching this are in the industry of doing antivirus blocking, filtering of any sort, you should be very concerned about this because if it's let to stand, if Quad9 gives up, as an example, um, this, we believe, will almost certainly be used as a, uh, a lever for other types of filtering systems. Um, and if you do business in Germany or, in fact, do business in the EU at all, 
this this might have negative repercussions that are that are pretty significant uh, ongoing. Yeah. Yeah, this is really a concern when private companies kind of, in not the first time these companies have tried to do this, kind of dictate mm -hmm. the internet like you can't have this. Uh, it, we've seen this with some of the takedowns, the domain takeovers, and things like that where they're able to, you know, domain seizures. Uh, and for things that aren't really, it, it's an it's a debate uh, that's not as simple as they're doing something uh, obviously criminal, so to speak. You know what I mean? They're it, it's really boy, is it a it's and, a real and you know, DNS is pretty far removed, very far removed. Recursive resolvers especially are very far removed from the actual infringing content. And yeah. German, German law in particular has a, has a clause called, uh, well, it's, the English translation is duty of care um, that, that extends in, in some instances to that. But, but there are specific call outs for um, people who are exempted, telecommunications providers, I believe, is one of them. But we think that DNS recursive resolution and other services potentially in the future need to be added to that because this doesn't do anybody any good. Like this is a this is a this could end up with a very big net negative, not just for Germany but for the EU as a whole, if if it becomes untenable to do business in some of these regions because of these burdens by the additional work, whether those are financial or administrative burdens, it's all the same. Um, so we're we're very much opposed to it. Exactly, just it is not something that makes a ton of yeah. sense to me. Just yeah, turn my phone off. Um, but yeah, that's so. Those are the. I mean, that's kind of some of the big news we've had. I mean, we've had you know the usual. We Quad Nine has expanded in a whole bunch more cities. I think we have something like twenty or thirty cities in the backlog queue right now that we're slowly turning up, um, which is great. We have more partners who have given us. Um, uh, hosting and server resources, so that's great. We're, you know, South America is going to be turned on real soon now, uh, in a big way. We we actually have facilities there, but now we're basically doubling or even tripling our infrastructure. More points there. of presence means less yeah. latency, and that's what gets people excited. Yeah, when I'm yeah and this. and and again, <laughs> kind of with that the political layer on this as well. That the the more we can keep the data in country, you know, from clients who are asking for things and having that resolved by servers that are very close by, in their own nation. That's great for everybody's security. Whether it's encrypted or unencrypted doesn't matter. Um, it, but keeping the answers as local as we can get them to the end user is really, really important, um, especially in underserved areas like, yeah, as an example, Africa, where um, you know so much traffic is moved across international borders. The closer we can get things to end users, the better it is for security and privacy. Yeah, that's it's a win-win all the way around. Yep. Yep. What else is happening? There is actually a lot of stuff happening in the DNS world. A lot of it's kind of boring, or it's. it's I mean, I think it's exciting because I'm a DNS yeah. nerd. But um, you know, so there are new standards that are coming out, which I think are really fascinating. Like uh, um, uh, uh, Oblivious Doe, which I talked about. Um, there are some people are experimenting with DNS over um, Quick. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, we're not there yet. We're waiting a little bit more for the standards to settle. Um, but. Uh, uh, Extended DNS errors is one that we actually we have a we, we're very interested in and we'll start looking at shortly. That means that right now, whenever you do a request to Quad Nine and we block it because it's on our block list of you know however many millions of domains, we give you back an NX domain, which is great. It protects you against the threat, but it's kind of an error. And you look at it and go, well, okay, couldn't resolve the domain, uh, you know, can't. That's kind of a lie. And of course, we are lying. We are answering that we can't resolve it, but it doesn't give you any additional information. So extended DNS errors is a new draft that's that's come out in the last year um, that essentially allows us to tag that NX domain with more information. Uh, you know, some of it's very simple. It's just a numeric, like uh, DNSSEC failed, right? That's That happens sometimes. Or uh, blocked, like we can block a domain. And so you get some additional context or your client at some point in the future will get some additional context um, and be able to surface that up to the end user. So they can, instead of seeing just a host not found, they'd see um, your DNS service provider block this domain due to security reasons. Like that would be really, really useful. And yeah. so we're hoping to be able to include some of that in the future here with this extended DNS error set. And there's also a lot of other stuff that now we can put in that EDN, uh, EDE um, response that that is much more informative. So that's there's going to be some interesting stuff happening with that in the next couple of years. I'm hoping some of the device manufacturers uh, or operating system manufacturers are are taking that to heart and they'll actually surface that to the user. That, that would be great because then we don't just say it's DNS. It's DNS and here's the answer we got back. Right, right. And, and then here's why it's the DNS. Like, here's and, not and why it's the DNS. DNS yeah. told us why it's broke Yeah, because right, right now really we only have 
functionally, there's only two different errors that you get back in DNS. It's an NX domain, which is host not found, meaning that I know that this domain exists, but the thing you're asking for in particular doesn't exist, and we know that that's the case. Or serve fail, like I couldn't talk to any of the resources that I need to ask the questions. Those are really weak signals. I mean, they're terrible, and um, and we need to do something better. So I'm really hopeful that EDE is something that uh, is everyone starts to adopt and, and be able to display up to the user um, in the next couple of years. Well, that's awesome. Was there anything else we have to cover today? Sure, we... but no, I, I'm <laughs> I'm good. We, as always, there's the, you know there's a, there's a million different conferences and discussions and stuff that I'd love to talk about. But I think yeah. that those those are, these are some of the top level things for Quad Nine. I'm really thankful for your time today. And uh, I will I, I, I will link to down below to obviously Quad Nine. If you haven't heard of them, I'll link to yeah. the previous video we did. We talked pretty long about a lot of details about DNS. If you're curious about the entire history of, yeah. of quad nine, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. And uh, in case you didn't know, as we mentioned earlier, there's no logs or anything. You're extremely okay. privacy oriented. And now you've taken it a step further yeah. by, uh, putting the shackles on yourself of going, no, no, we are now, we, we don't just say it. We're in trouble if we don't yep. say put it. our money where our mouth is, as they say in English. Yep. I love it. So, well, thanks, John It's awesome. Uh, and, uh, thanks for joining. Take care. Thanks for your time. See you next time. And thank you for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. To hire a sure project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click on the Hire Us button right at the top. To help this channel out in other ways, there's a Join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the descriptions of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store, where we have a wide variety of shirts and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thank you again, and we look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, check out some of our other videos.